behalf of the Black and Tech community of interest, it's an honor to be able to gather here today to commemorate and celebrate Juneteenth. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to reflect upon the significance of this pivotal, pivotal moment in history and how it affects our lives in 21st century corporate America. We know that you could have been anywhere else this afternoon, but you chose to be here with us. And for that, I say thank you. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day or Jubilee Day, represents the emancipation of enslaved African-Americans in the United States. I'm amazed at how far we've come. Three years ago, many people weren't aware of what Juneteenth was, and now not only is it a national holiday, but this is LaVox's second annual Juneteenth panel discussion. Today, we gather not only to acknowledge this pivotal milestone, but also to speak to the resilience, strength, and immeasurable contributions that come from a diversified workplace. Juneteenth is a day of remembrance, reflection, and rejoicing, a time to recognize the struggles of the past while also embracing the triumphs and progress made since that fateful day. This panel brings together esteemed individuals from diverse backgrounds and organizations united by their passion for equality, justice, and education. Through their collective wisdom and insights, we hope to illuminate the historical significance of Juneteenth, explore its contemporary relevance, and foster dialogue on the steps we can take to build a more equitable corporate culture. As we embark on this journey of enlightenment and dialogue, let us embrace the spirit of unity and empathy. Let us approach these conversations with open hearts and open minds, recognizing that the pursuit of justice requires active engagement from every member of our society. Today, we reaffirm our commitment to promoting equality, inclusivity, and social justice, not only on Juneteenth, but every day of the year. We invite you to join us in this important conversation as we collectively strive to create a world where freedom and justice truly reign for all. This session is being recorded and it will be made available by next Wednesday, June the 21st. We want this to be a conversation, so if you have any questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. If you are a Lovebox employee and you would like to be added to the Black in Tech mailing list or become a volunteer, please send an email to bitleadership at livevox.com and I will also put that email address in the chat. Um, Lonnie Bunch said it best, today is an opportunity to both look back, but to look ahead to make sure that the notion of freedom and the fragility of it is always protected and celebrated. I'll now pass it over to your awesome host, Rowan Sarah, to kick things off. All right. Thank you, Celicia. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start with um, introducing our wonderful panelists that we have here today. And it is an honor for you guys to join us. So once again, thank you. I'm going to start with Rodney Bolden. He's our VP of Sales and Financial Wellness. We also have uh, Big O or Clarence Outland Jr., Regional Sales Manager with J&J. Bill Houston or William Houston, VP Software Engineering uh, with Fifth Third Bank. Um, you know our uh, Jason Lester, Director of Site Reliability and Engineering here at Livebox, and then our own Linda Esperin, SVP of People Operations. So this will be our panel. I will be co-facilitating with my partner in crime here, Sarah Serco. And with that said, let's jump right in and get the party going. Um, I'm actually going to start with you, Rodney. In 2021, President Biden signed a bill to make Juneteenth National Independence Day a national holiday with 46 states who recognize and celebrate this day. What does that mean to you and to your organization? Well, thanks, Ro. Um, for myself, it is finally acknowledging a key piece of our history. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, individuals like Opal Lee have been campaigning to make Juneteenth a national holiday for many, many years. And it's important that, I mean, Alethea gave a great overview of a, a little bit of background on the holiday. This is a time where finally, after two and a half years, word of the Emancipation Proclamation reached the westernmost Confederate state of Texas. And, and it happened also two months after Lee surrendered to Grant. So for me, it's it's an acknowledgement of history, which is often for Black Americans has not always occurred. Right. Often our history is not shared with others. And to the point where many of us don't even know this history. 
So there are folks when this was announced and happened, even among my fellow brothers and sisters that didn't know about Juneteenth. So I am, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm one. I didn't know. I, I, I'm, I'm happy. And so for me personally, I'm happy. For Morgan Stanley, what it what it meant and, and what the holiday means. And we've done a lot this week and there's more Juneteenth activities next week. It's a time to reflect on our past, you know, what's what we've been able to achieve, but also what are our challenges. And speaking of those challenges, thinking about how we can solve some of that. You know, when we look at the Black community, we still have a fraction of the wealth of white community. We still are encumbered in, in greater amounts by debt. We are less likely to own homes. So there's a lot of things. And when you look at a primary engine of wealth building, which is entrepreneurship, Black Americans, specifically Black women, are much more likely to uh, start businesses these days. But the biggest challenge is access to capital. We're more, far less likely to receive uh, access to capital, either via loan or, uh, or, or startup money. So for us, it's about, okay, celebrate where we've come and all that we've been able to accomplish, commemorate that day of June 19th, 1865, but let's focus on the future and what we can do better to help empower our brothers and sisters. Outstanding. Thanks, you, Rodney. And, and you, you mentioned a lot of that, a lot of stuff there. So um, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to piggyback a little bit and throw something out to to Bill or, or William. Um, you had mentioned some of the, the ideas or, or things that you guys have uh, starting next week to celebrate within your organization. And and that promotes a sense of allyship. Right. So, so Bill, what strategies can corporations employ to promote allyship and solidarity among your their employees, particularly in the relation to the historical content of what Juneteenth really is? So we know what we we've heard what Rabani said. What what do you think? What are your thoughts there? Oh, great question. Uh, thank you very much, and thanks also for the invite and allowing me to be a part of this. I'm giving honor to. Just kidding. Just trying to tell. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So I had to save of my life. Go ahead. You good? <laughs> Just kidding. With you. <laughs> One of the aspects about Juneteenth, if you think about it, was when you think about the source of the issue was late communication, right? A group of individuals not being aware of something made late. And when you think about diversity and inclusion initiatives, they must be supported from the from the top down, meaning that as much as employees, we can try to push things from the top up, from the bottom up, but when it's pushed from the top down. Um, it really helps out a lot. So one strategy is just communication and embracement by CEOs. I mean, this has to start at the top. CEOs need to communicate the importance to this to their leadership, and it needs to flow down to their leadership and all the way down to the bottom. Because otherwise, we're reading and seeing what a CEO says at an employee level. But then when we're going to our managers or their managers and asking for things, in fact, how many people today in order to attend this session their manager, you had to ask your manager, can I go? And their manager was like, well, no, that's not important. Well, if the CEO communicates that all the way down the, the pipeline so that everyone knows that it's important, and if these are not just words on our website or things on our social media page, that we're really embracing this and we really mean that, I think communicating that from the top down will really go a lot to help promote this and build um, allyship and so much more. Absolutely. Um, anyone else have want to piggyback or got some? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to, Ro. Please, awesome. go ahead, Ronnie. Because something William said jarred something for me. Yeah. He talked about the communication being there late. Mm -hmm. Another thing is transparency. Mm. Because what would happen back then after the <laughs> was signed, proclamation was signed in 1863, as Union soldiers would go into Confederate territories and, and take over that territory for the Union, they would let folks know about the Emancipation Proclamation. Right. But slave owners and, and, and members of the Confederacy, of course, never would communicate that. And it's not that different in some companies today where when you're thinking about, OK, things like my path to promotion and what do I need to do? You know, these are some of the things that for other employees, you know, especially employees in the majority that they've grown up knowing they've been enculturated knowing here are the steps that you take in order to get ahead. 
These are some of the secrets that have been kept from members of the Black community in many ways. So it's also about transparency. This is another key aspect of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Letting folks know that if you support them and if you believe in a diverse workforce at all levels, there has to be transparency as to what it takes to get there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that was that was rich, man. This is getting deep. All right. So so we're trying, so we're talking. Bro, Go ahead. Is, there's another comment? Oh, yeah. yeah, I just wanted to Please add. Jump in. Absolutely. I think, I think communication and transparency are excellent first steps, but I, I think you certainly have to have processes and systems in place to support it and a continuity program or actions in place as well. Because uh, I don't know how many fellow Greeks I have on the line, but when we, we had to learn a poem when I was pledging, and one of the lines was, uh, I'd rather see a sermon than to hear one any day. Just one line of it. And so, you know, you can tout diversity or what you're championing, but the proof is in the pudding. What systems, what processes do you have in place to support it? And then again, you know, going back to something William mentioned, it have, has to be a top-down initiative or, you know, top-down, bottom-up. But if it doesn't come from leadership, it doesn't it's like a line with no teeth. You know, you can roar all you want, but you can't secure your prey. So, I really think you have to have those <laughs> systems in place. It has to be metric uh, as well. And it's a business imperative, you know, for it as well. You know, when you're touting diversity, uh, there's a McKinsey study. I don't recall the year. I mean, it's pro the proof is in the data. You know, more diverse teams and organizations perform at a higher clip on a more on a more on a consistent basis. Right. Right. So I so we're we're talking about this. Obviously, communication, transparency, identity, corporate identity is what we're referring to in regards to what, there, what does that identity look like in regards to diversity and inclusion? Um, that, that leads us to a great question. Um, Linda, how about can you share with us what diversity and inclusion means to, to us here at Livebox and what that identity looks like and feels like here? Yes, I'm excited to do that. And uh, thank you very much for inviting me on the panel. Um, you know, William touched on it, as did Clarence, and, and I'm going to give you some examples of putting communication and normalization and practice and policy. Um, you know, how do you make that action? To me, uh, diversity means supporting diversity by taking concrete action mm -hmm. to build a more diverse team and to increase a truly inclusive culture. You, ha you have to have both, it's gotta, it's gotta, it'll feed on itself. So <clears throat> historically, you know, if you go way back, we, we, we weren't celebrating too much diversity. So starting about four, maybe five years ago, we started celebrating and recognizing diversity events, but we were kind of late on some, cause you know, the whirlwind of work goes on. And, and I remember one of my, you know, HR, um, a couple of our HR leaders came out and said, hey, you know, you were right on time with the Women's Month, but you were late on the Black History Month. And what does that mean? And I'm like, oh, my God, it means we got to get our act together and get a calendar running. <laughs> <laughs> so we did. Um, so, you know, you got to plan ahead so that more people can be included in the planning mm -hmm. so that you make it a better event, so that it's enjoyable and people can benefit more from it. Um we also sponsor discussions of the facts behind the benefits of diversity. So awareness building, um, what gets in the way of building diversity, what unconscious bias is, what it looks like on the job, how it acts, those studies that um, I think, I don't remember if it was William or Clarence was talking about uh, the McKinsey studies and, and stuff. And yeah, you know, diverse companies do 10 points better in the money. Uh, so there's a there's a, a lot of business reasons and just personal fulfillment reasons why we want to be more diverse. So uh, training on that awareness building, it also means the processes and practices and training, though. So we do affirmative action uh, reporting, but more than that, we leverage the reports and analyze it <clears throat> so that we can look to see if there's to make sure that we have pay equity, to make sure that we have no adverse impact going on in hiring and promotions, et cetera. Um, and we do management training in interviewing, in compensation management and performance management, because that's the real fabric, right? Of somehow, of sometimes what how discrimination can happen. 
And so having strong programs that make sure that managers are making decisions based on concrete, observable metrics mm -hmm. is another way that we make sure that we have fairness in the workforce. So those are kind of the things that we've done kind of moving up to now. Last year, we started uh, doing more around communities of interest. So we've had women in tech for a couple of years, but of course, Black in Tech started last year. Mm -hmm. And it's been a blast um, being impacted by this organization and watching how <coughs> the two communities are working together to um, provide more energy and intelligence behind really important programs like our mentorship program this year is backed by both groups. We have over a hundred people participating now in that. Awesome. Um, and, and also working together to impact our community outreach program. Yes. So in our community outreach program, we always wanted to bring together to focus on people, primarily kids, but people in underserved communities um, and that's really important. But getting people more involved with that, you know, it exposes more of our population to diverse communities. And that's half the problem, right? People stay in their own echo chambers. And so when you reach out to communities that are different from, from me or from you into different communities, that's going to build awareness. That's going to make it a more a transparent and open environment as well. So I'm pretty excited about the new stuff happening these years as well. Absolutely. And I think the key, one of the key things that you mentioned there, Linda, was awareness, mm -hmm. right? Awareness is such a powerful word when it comes to diversity mm -hmm. and inclusion. Um, you can't perform action if you're blind to the fact. So That's you've right. got to be aware of what is and what it isn't. You've got to be aware of what is different from what you look at in the mirror. And I think that's important to be aware. Um, Sarah, what are your thoughts on that? So my thoughts on diversity and inclusion in, in general, maybe mine a little bit more pie in the sky, but it really um, works to determine good uh, versus um, initiatives that we want to take as a company. Um, if I had to define what good looks like, it would be having a population uh, within my box that is a reflection of the population of America, which is very mm -hmm. diverse, right? Like, and, and duplicating that here. And the art is having a diverse population work in harmony, which means that, uh, you know, and having an environment where everyone feels uh, safe and feels that they can bring their true authentic selves to work. So all of the things that when we talk about diversity and inclusion at Livebox, I, I kind of do it with that lens. It does, it does it fit into that category of what that looks like I'd love to hear your thoughts on how things are done at Stanley Morgan, Rodney. What are some of the things and practices and the way that they see diversity and inclusion? Yeah, thanks for that, Sarah. You know, for us, we have five core principles. The core principles are do the right thing, put clients first, lead with exceptional ideas, give back. And the fifth one, and actually it's number four, but I, I want it to be dramatic, is a commitment to diversity. Inclusion. So it is one of our key core values. And, you know, the way we've done that is a variety of ways right now. What we've done is um, we created uh, two years ago something called the Institute for Inclusion. And the Institute for Inclusion is both an uh, external strategy and an internal strategy. So, external, it's looking at racial wealth gap and what we can do to uh, address it. And we've already started a number of programs. So we have a small business academy for diverse businesses, diverse entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. to help them better access supplier diversity opportunities. We have a uh, something called the Equity in Education and Careers Consortium. This is a group that works with nine not-for-profits, and these not-for-profits are across the country, and their target constituents are teens and young adults. And the Equity in Education and Careers Consortium, what it does, <clears throat> excuse me, it educates them on financial wellness, but also on careers, teaching them about resume writing, interview skill, networking, things of that nature. Additionally, we also know though, it's important to advance diversity, equity, and inclusion within your own organization. So we committed, we have uh, diverse leadership academies where for six months, P 
people go through uh, that are tapped to be or identified as put high potential performers to get to that next management level, they go through a leadership where they learn, and it's run by McKinsey, actually. Um, we have a, ta a talent accelerator. These are folks that maybe are not right there at the officer level, but just below, helping them to get to that officer level. And one last thing I'll mention is we have a one officer's initiative. Because if you're looking to increase diversity in the workforce, the one other thing I'll say is that we have clearly defined metrics for success. And that's another key aspect of a diversity program. Because it's wonderful to say, hey, diversity is important to us, but put pen to paper and come up with some metrics and goals. And that's what we've done. So, and one of the things we want to do is increase a, um, Black and Hispanic talent at the executive level by 50% by next year. That's a commitment in our diversity and inclusion report for this year. Now, how do you do that? Two ways. You promote, but you also bring in people. So a lot of times recruiting is done at the lower levels. You have recruitment done on campuses. We do that. We, we, we certainly do that. But also we have what we call a one officers initiative where we go out and we identify folks who can come in at officer level from other organizations and we recruit them and bring them into the organization. Got it. Man, that's that's a robust, I mean, somebody really thought about that long and hard group of people. So thank you for sharing those bright ideas with us. So shifting gears a little bit and um, away from uh, corporate practices and strategies, a little bit more towards, hey, what are some of um, the things that you feel around this Juneteenth Day and the significance of it? So Jason, I want to ask you, knowing what Juneteenth is, do you think that something like Fourth of July, something that is so significant in American history, does and should uh, it have the same significance for Blacks as it does for Caucasians? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, that, that's a very interesting question, and I look at it from a couple of ways. You know, one is w without the Fourth of July, you know, we wouldn't really have our our country. You know, if we had lost, you know, all bets are off. Um, but at the same time. It, you know, it, it's it's our history. Juneteenth um, definitely marks a the start of, of a very major change. Um, and, you know, kind of jokingly, I like barbecue. So if you're telling me I get two days that I can barbecue every year, well, all right, I'll, I'll do that. But 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 really, um, I, I don't think it does. I don't think it has the same significance. I, I think Part of it is is our lost culture, uh, our, sorry, not lost culture, but our lost history of, you know, growing up, we never heard of Juneteenth, you know, and now understanding the way that, uh, you know, we knew everything about July, the uh, uh, July 4th, you know, we know who we were fighting, why we were fighting, what we did, who was, you know, riding in the night or not, but nothing about Juneteenth, nothing about, you know, how uh, the message of our freedom got to us. So yeah, I, I think it will be a little different, um, but but I think both are very good holidays to celebrate for for all of us. Absolutely, I think there. Yes, absolutely. Can I add something to that perspective? Of course, please. So, yeah, you know, um, when it comes to Juneteenth versus July Fourth, Juneteenth, you know, very clear on July Fourth is a Black American conflicted. One of the things I encourage everyone to do, if you've never read this speech, so Frederick Douglass, uh, back in 1852, up in Rochester, delivered a speech called The, uh, the Meaning of, the, of July 4th for the Negro. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just read a couple lines from it because it really sums up. It's a long speech and spoke for, I think, two hours. But what he said is, I am not included within the pale of this glorious anniversary. Your high independence only reveals the immeasurable diff distance between us. The mm -hmm. blessings in which you this day rejoice and are not enjoyed, are, are not enjoyed rather in common. The rich inheritance of justice, liberty, prosperity, and independence bequeathed by your fathers is shared by you, not by you, but not by me. The sunlight that brought light and healing to you has brought stripes and death to me. And finally, the 4th of July is yours, not mine. 
So, and it's important to know that this speech for years was carried in black and black publications on the 4th of July, just as a reminder um, of that dichotomy. We are American, proud to be American, but at the same time, America is not always proud to have us. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, it really is. And, you know, I think about Martin Luther King. So 4th of July commemorates the signing of the, de the, the Declaration of Independence. In his speech on Washington, which we all know, you know, I have a dream, but another section of it, he talked about how the, de the Declaration of Independence was a promissory note for which for people, Americans of color, America has defaulted on because it has not delivered on that promise. And, but at the same time, being an American, knowing folks, uh, relatives, friends, colleagues who have fought and served and died for this country, having been at West Point, speaking to cadets of color um, and, and hearing how they were becoming leaders to lead troops in the battles with potential enemies or to protect America's interests. And they were proud of that. And I'm proud of that too. So it's kind of my, my personal feeling on the 4th of July is kind of like maybe some people's Facebook status on their relationship. It's complicated. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, Rodney. Fair yeah. enough. Fair. It, that is fair. Yes. That is fair enough. And <laughs> it's so educational um, to me as, as someone who is not of African descent, because when I thought 4th of July, I didn't think anything different because Juneteenth, the day itself, and it being um, a federal holiday is, is a very new concept. So one of the things that I, I kind of uh, raised an eyebrow or asked myself pretty recently, so this is a very um, selfish question because I'm genuinely curious. So uh, Clarence, and maybe you can educate me on this. What is an appropriate way to express happy Juneteenth uh, to someone of a black descent, because I, I came across somebody in public, right? And, and I genuinely wanted to because I'm celebrating with you and I'm, I'm happy about the day. It's a stranger. I, I Do I say happy Juneteenth? Do I say congratulations on the federal holiday? Do I high five? Like, I don't know how to approach it, but I, I want them to know that I'm an ally, that I'm, I'm, I'm with you all and I'm happy. So how would I go about expressing that? What I would say first, the answer to that question is very subjective and, and relative, mm -hmm. depending on who you're speaking to. Because quite frankly, and I think uh, Jason or Rodney alluded to it, a lot of us did not know about Juneteenth growing up. You know, I'm from, I'm from Alabama originally, and I met a guy in college who was from Marshall, Texas, and that was the first time I heard about Juneteenth. And uh, so I subsequently educated myself. And I think that's an excellent segue is to first educate yourself as to what Juneteenth is about. And that goes both ways, you know, for uh, non-African Americans as well as African Americans. You know, we all need to be educated about it uh, because, you know, you saying happy Juneteenth to someone that could initiate a conversation. If you know nothing about it and all of a sudden you go into it, Oh, man, you know, that's uh, that's a very uncomfortable, you know, scenario, you know, when that happens. Right. So I would say number one for everyone, you know, educate yourself. Um, and then for me, and this may be, you know, some people may not agree with it. Uh, if you don't mean it, don't say it. That's that's my personal take. Okay. Um, you know, obviously, you know, a lot of us, you know, we're all, you know, work for, you know, corporations or firms. And uh, most of the people on, on this panel are leaders. So a lot of times you, you may be in a situation as a leader where it's appropriate to acknowledge, you know, Juneteenth or some other holidays or whatnot that you may not personally agree with, but your corporate or professional responsibility is to say something. So with, with that, you know, you can't legislate a person's personal beliefs or whatnot, but certainly if you're in a leadership position within a, uh, within a firm, you know, a lot of times you have to toe the line of the company. And I think that also bears a certain responsibility to fully educate yourself, to make sure that you understand it. And it really goes back to what I was taught when I was younger. Hey, uh, treat other folks the way you'd like to be treated. And if you were in that scenario, how would you want to be treated? I think if we ask ourselves those questions, you know, it'll come across earnestly. 
uh, in a land well. Okay, yeah. I'll keep that in mind. Any other thoughts or suggestions on how we could perhaps approach the situation? So, so last Juneteenth, when we had this panel, we talked about the difference between advocates and allies, right? Um, and I'm still learning how to be an ally. And when we heard, and I think it was you, Ro, who gave us this insight that said, when you're part of the demographic themselves and you're looking for change, that you're an advocate and that you know, you're working towards a change in this advocacy role and that allies are people who are kind of outside of that group who are making themselves aware of this and, and they're aware of the struggles and they want to help support spread the word to areas that the advocates may not be able to reach. Mm -hmm. Now, is there a different approach or an understanding that you have of that clearance or is that pretty much define you in your mind what an advocate versus an ally <clears throat> is? Well, you know, I'll tell you, I, I'm a keep it simple guy. And, uh, <laughs> and, you know, I really use sports analogies with my team and my leadership team a lot because I think it's a euphemism for life. Uh, in my opinion, my personal opinion, an ally is a cheerleader, whereas an advocate is a teammate. That's how Got I see it. I think both are, you know, very important. You certainly need folks cheering you on and uh, in agreement with you and, and so forth. But advocacy, that's a, that's a different level of commitment, in, in, my, in my opinion. You know, an advocate is someone who's actually in the trenches with you, you know, where they're putting their personal, uh, professional or whatever reputation or whatnot at stake. You know, they have skin in the game, if you will. You know, you can be an ally by sending an uplifting text message or a phone call or maybe speaking up after a meeting, whereas an advocate is speaking along with you in that meeting. Or if you're not in the room, that advocate is actually still, you know, toting your banner and leading the charge. So I think that's a, I think it's a different level of commitment between, you know, those two uh, roles, but both are very important. But I'm looking for advocates. Oh, got it. Okay. Good of you to share with us. So, uh, Linda, you shared with us kind of what diversity and inclusion means for us here at LiveVox. What are some key initiatives that we're taking to further enhance diversity here? You touched on it some. <laughs> You're on mute, Linda. Oh, I was muted. Okay. Um, yeah, I did touch on some um, already, but I guess there's one special thing that's going on. It's uh, a pretty big deal. <laughs> Uh, that we are uh, this year, John has uh, let us know that he wants to take the CEO uh, action pledge commitment uh, for building diversity in the company through stated objectives. So I'll give you just a little bit of history on this. Um, it's, it's, it's a consortium of people uh, and organizations. Uh, the, the full organization behind this is the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion. It was a collective formed about six years ago, uh, 2017, by CEOs and leaders from the bigs, Accenture, BCC, Deloitte, um, et cetera, et cetera. KPMG is in there, um, lots of others, uh, Fortune 500 and Fortune 1000 companies. Um, today it's led uh, by PwC US Chairman and Senior Partner, Tim Ryan. Now, what is the pledge? The CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, trademarked, aims to rally the business community to advance diversity and inclusion within the workplace. So what does that mean? It means that the CEO takes a pledge um, from a set of actions that they, that they pledge that they will work on to achieve measurable outcome. Uh, the whole goal of these would be to cultivate a trusting environment, uh, they want to implement and expand unconscious bias education and training is a theme that runs all the way through. Um, they want to engage in um, sharing best known diversity, equity, and inclusion programs and initiatives and engage with the board of directors with developing and evaluating the impact of these diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies. So right now we're working with John to um, and I and I know that he uh, was logged into this training for a while. He may have been pulled away. There's a a bunch of board stuff going on right now. Unfortunately, at the same time of this meeting, so he may not be on right now. 
Um, but he, uh, we're in the process of working with him uh, and the board is weighed in and, and we're getting input from our friends in black and tech and women in tech to, to select from the lists of, um, of items uh, on what we want to pledge to. So, oh, John, I, I hear you're on. So maybe can you unmute John and he can say a few words about the pledge? Sure. That's Will you better. unmute him? Yes. I, can. I don't know whether you can unmute yourself, John. No. Um, there you are, John. You should be able to talk. That's exciting. Am hey. I a special guest? Can you see me or just hear me? We can, we can just, just hear you. Well, you know what? That's 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 old school. I like it. It's like how we used. <laughs> it's like how we used to do it. But I um, I just have a couple of words, Linda. If it's okay, absolutely. I mean, the, the, you know, my my pledge here and my commitment to this initiative and and diversity and inclusion, you know, in general, is is something that's very sincere, and I am. Very excited to see the the energy that Sarah and Linda and the others on the HR team have put into making sure that that we sponsor these types of activities. I, I a lot of the things uh, people on the panel have said already really resonated with me. I think especially uh, the characterization of of Frederick Douglass's comments, which I I totally understand the origin of those, and and to some extent. And it's hard not to agree with them. But I also want to say that yeah, I like this holiday. This is one of my favorites from the perspective of how much meaning it carries, uh, especially amidst the backdrop, I think, of July 4th. And the July 4th holiday is a celebration of the Declaration of Independence. And the Declaration of Independence uh, amplified uh, that, the, you know, that all men are created equally. And yet a third of the participants, a third of the signatories were actually slave owners. And I, what I celebrate about that then is, is, you know, what I think is, is the concept that democracy and justice and freedom, you know, I wish we all wish that they would move faster, but they are a process and they, they uh, sometimes it, it's a grind, but we, we do make progress every year. And I, I think the celebration of that of Juneteenth, following two and a half years after the uh, Emancipation Proclamation, it took two and a half more years uh, to to uh, to establish what this holiday <laughs> celebrates. And the work was just starting then. Uh, we had the Civil Rights Act. We had the Equal Pay Act. There's a lot of work still to do. And I just wanted to, to uh, say how much I, I celebrate uh, th these types of things and, and the progress that they are amplify. We do, you, you may not see it, but we, uh, on an annual basis and, and, uh, and sometimes more often, review to make sure that we're adhering to equal pay, but also equal opportunity, equal promotion, equal compensation, uh, and making sure that we're being uh, as fair as humanly possible as a, a company. Again, still more work to do. But, uh, you know, I want to uh, just uh, one more time. Uh, and I know I've already taken more than my time, but the, th the things that uh, I think Rodney said it uh, best, there's a lot of studies, study after study that show that that it's good good for business to be more diverse and to and to organizationally drive inclusion. And I, I just want to say that that's one of the uh, one of the core tenets uh, that we embrace every day in an executive team it's it's of course it's the right thing to do but it's also it's also good business and so i would just ask everybody to continue uh, to to join me in embracing diversity and inclusion at all levels across uh, across all the all the different uh categories and and uh, minorities and uh i would also ask you to join me in in celebrating uh, Juneteenth on Monday and and uh, and understanding as you celebrate it, uh, you know, all of the significance of 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 the holiday and the celebration and what it what it truly stands for. So thanks for the couple minutes here, Linda. I appreciate it. And for, of course, for all the hard work that you and the team and the panel and our our whole uh, black and technology uh, uh, team uh, has put forth. It's, it's greatly appreciated by everybody. Great. Thanks, John.
Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And I'll just I'll just finish off in um, talking about this year, the specific actions that are in the the CEO pledge. These aren't totally finalized yet. John uh, wants to make wants to do one more final. But our recommendations after input from Black in Tech uh, and Women in Tech uh, and the HR team generally um, out of this whole list of um, practices, many of which we're already doing, I've already spoken to. But the ones we want to focus on this year, cultural awareness unconscious bias training, and women and minorities in STEM, uh, science, technology, um, et cetera, in the schools, right, uh, in classes. So those those would be the three. And what we would do, once again, is um, determine very specific goals and metrics on what we're going to do, how we're going to measure our success, et cetera. And of course, the uh, the, the overall, the, the the enhanced meaning of the CEO pledge is that this is published as a public company. We're publishing it. We're reporting it. We're we're reporting back to our board of directors on it. So this is a this is a very important step in boy talk about building awareness and normalizing you know appropriate both from the head and the heart, Sarah, uh, the things that uh, we want to do. So I'm super excited about the pledge, and I'm super excited to have a, a CEO that's that's um, an advocate. Thank you, Linda. That's that's awesome. Thank you. Appreciate that. And I thank you uh, for our surprise guest, John. That was, a, that, was a, <laughs> <laughs> that was awesome as well. So we appreciate that. We appreciate the content there. So absolutely. Um, there's a lot of, of takeaways in regards to what was just said, in regards to where do we go with the organizations? Where do we go with corporate to raise awareness? And Linda, you brought up a, a bunch of couple, a bunch of things. Um, but I do want to the point on on some of the individual things that we can do uh, to help change and, and how we can help change each other or how we can um, use our own individuality, our own voice to promote change. So, so Rodney, with, with that in mind, uh, what is the power of your voice and in indiv- individuality important? How, how is it important in succeeding within your career in your corporate environment? The power of your voice and individuality, how is that important? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question, Ro. I've always seen that with myself and with others, but I'll just stick to myself. You know, I have something, I have a story to tell, and we all do. Mm-hmm. So born and raised in East New York, Brooklyn, um, you know, which uh, you may know this, there's now a TV series about it because it was the highest crime rate place in all of New York for many years. Um, went away to school. You know, I had success, started on Wall Street. And when I started on Wall Street, the only other Black person in my company was in the mailroom. So I have a story to tell. I have perspective. My voice can help others. And that's what I communicate. When I find an opportunity to help another person within my organization or another department, I reach out and do that. I let them know, here, here's something you may not have thought about. Here's something you may not have considered or a direction. And it's based upon, and the only way I knew that, Ro, didn't learn it in college, didn't learn it, you know, um, uh, um, from my family. I learned it through my career experience. Mm-hmm. So your individual voice and career journey has merit and it can change organizations because I've seen it done and I've done it personally where things that have been implemented simply because my individual perspective caused it to be so. Absolutely. That's great. And I, I agree with you hundred um, percent. Back when I was a contact center manager, I created a mentorship program because I saw so many, we were, we were hiring so many individuals for supervisor roles or leadership roles from outside the company. Meanwhile, I had um, agents who inspired to become supervisors or managers and so forth. Um, so what I did was I created a, our, our mentorship program um, and I allowed for these agents to become more vested. I allowed for these agents to, to feel like they had a more stake within the, the context of this, just taking phone calls. I wanted them to show the big picture of, of how their role impacted the bigger picture, right? How their right. role as an agent. 
and from there, we not only created four supervisors, um, and all every single one of them was minority, whether a female or or a person of color, um, but we also increased our retention in regards to our team. We had the highest retention rate out of the whole contact center because our agents felt value. They felt like they had a career path. Um, we actually have individual within our company that I actually promoted, uh, Lou Cockerham, if he's on the call, I'm shouts out to you, my friend. Um, but he was um, he was a person that was raised those ranks through that empowerment. So, so I think that's very powerful when we talk about our voice and how we can not only um, promote and empower, but we can also identify and train and set career pathing as well. Um, William, to that point, man, uh, how do you empower others to further their career? What do you do within your business or, or also within the community as well? How do you empower others through that power of your voice? Yeah, that's a great question. And so many so far have already, you know, have, have alluded to that. But when yeah. I'm speaking to groups, one thing I like to remind people about, you know, there's an analogy or a story about crabs in a barrel, right? How you got crabs trying to get out the barrel and there's normally one pulling them down. And sometimes I've seen people who look like me where they get to a certain point in their career and their attitudes. And, you know, when we reach out to them to help or to, or to, to be an advocate to help us push a charge. And it's kind of like, look, I got here. Now you got to get here the same way I did. And, and, but I like to, to encourage people to say, no, 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 no. When you get to a certain level in the company, reach back and reach help. Back. Yes. If somebody has gotten to that plateau already. Let's do this. Let's support them. Let's empower them. Let's help them be successful in their role. So that so go, because they're representing us as well. Because sometimes there's so many stereotypes against us. They're representing us. Let's help them to be successful so that they can reach back and help others. So all that's important. Participating in, in employee resource groups like this is important because you get to network. I think it was something that Rodney said, being able to help people in different departments or different areas of the company just to help them all be successful. And then when you touch, when you talk about the community, oh my gosh, personally, I, it, no offense to anybody, but personally, as a hiring manager, I, I get tired of just seeing certain types of names on resumes that come across indicating that there may be, they may come from other places, but there's so much rich knowledge. Well, I want to see more minority resumes hit hit my desk, but rather than complain about it, I want to be a part of the solution. So at my church doing software uh, coding camps to try to get young people interested in coding concepts. When I go talk at high schools, telling them about tech so they can get interested in these things so we can help to, be, you know, help to begin to build that pipeline to get people into these roles. So those are some things um, I like to do or advocate on my side. That's great. Any, anyone else want to tag in on that? Yeah, I, I do. Two points I want to make. Um, you know, one, you are not serving your organization or yourself uh, or doing yourself any favors um, by coming in to blend in. I think homogeneity is the enemy of innovation and creativity. Uh, you have something authentic to offer you know, as a diverse person. I think that's one of the benefits of why diverse teams do so well. Because when you have people showing up authentically, obviously you have to be talented at whatever the technical skill is, but if you show up and bring your authentic perspective to bear, I tend to think you, you'll you be more effective and have, uh, you know, greater greater impact. So that's one thing that I, that I really encourage folks, particularly folks who are newer into their career because you know, you don't know what you don't know. You're coming into a new environment. And the first thing you want to do is acquiesce and, and blend in. But I think when doing that, you're limiting what your contribution, you know, could be to the organization. And then that subsequently limits the potential of yourself and your firm, you know, by trying to blend in too much. Now, of course, there are certain unwritten norms that we all have lived and know about, uh, but bring your true true self to bear whenever you enter, uh, you know, to, to, to any role is what I would say. Be, be fully authentic uh, because, you know, there are organizations where traditionally, I know, for instance, at J&J, &J, when I first started there, you know, it was suit and tie all the time. Now, very relaxed settings. You can wear jeans and a polo, you know, to a meeting. Something very subtle, but you can just see how that environment has, you know, has relaxed on them. So, uh, 
I think authenticity uh, and diversity go hand in hand. And you realize the full fruit of that, you know, by being, you know, by being authentic. Authentic, having your own identity, bringing your identity to the table and all that it has to offer. Absolutely. It, yeah. one, one, one last thing too, because uh, I know we're, we're looking at time, but I think Exodus, I, I heard, I met the gentleman, uh, Dr. LaSalle LaFall. Uh, he was the first African-American president of the American College of Surgeons, was at Howard University Medical Center and School for a long time. And he actually trained briefly on a Dr. Charles Drew. Uh, so very strong mm -hmm. uh, brother. And he, he made a comment, uh, made a quote one time that I heard, and I think it's just around, you know, just rings so true. Excellence in performance will transcend artificial barriers created by man. So I think if you are a savant and excellent at what you do, it won't eliminate all hurdles, but it'll eliminate most. Uh, because if you're an expert, you'll be sought out mm -hmm. because that business imperative that we referenced a few times, that'll resonate with folks, even if they don't particularly, uh, you know, like you, uh, if you will. So, uh, you know, focusing on excellent performance and, and authenticity, I think you, you're, you're in a good spot. I love that, Clarence. Hey, can I make a quick comment here? Please. Um, you know, under under the heading of, you know, if you have to do a training program, you have to learn about it first. And so I learned a lot of stuff uh, through the years as, as I've been um, delivering training on um, diversity and awareness of diversity. And I just wanted to draw our attention to a, a Harvard business study where <clears throat> um, just to point out how perceptions about differences can make can can change the way people feel about how things are going. And the, what the study did was it had two groups of um, people. They're all MBA students, right, in these studies. And one was a, ho a homogeneous group and the other was a diverse group. And they all read a script that was exactly the same script for both teams. And it was, you know, going through a brainstorming session. And then the audience was another set of MBAs and they had to score how well those teams worked together. So the study was under the guise of you know, teamwork and scoring teams on how they're collaborating effectively or not. Exactly the same script, exactly the same. The diverse team was rated as having more conflict, more problems than the non-diverse team whether it was all white or all black or all Asian, they did it across all ways. So our perceptions about how different communications are happening, even with a, when you, when you maintain your, your, uh, uh, the same set of data, we will think that there's more conflict. In another study um, where a similar and supporting view came out was where they had a group of people, one homogeneous and one diverse, working on the same problem. It was like a work problem that they had to work out. And the, the, the homogeneous team came out with an answer first. The di diverse team took a little longer. The diverse team came out with a better solution as graded by the experts in that function, but they all thought it was harder. They didn't quite understand each other's languages. Mm -hmm. So the moral of the story was, they doubled their chance at arriving of the correct solution. It actually was that big of a deal. They went from 29 to 60% chance of arriving at the right solution if it's a diverse team. But it felt more uncomfortable mm -hmm. to the people doing it because they had to work a little harder. They had to listen to each other harder. They were, all these different perspectives were making it a little harder. So I just think that that gives me... Um, boy, some knowledge, right? That that makes me aware of what to expect when I'm brainstorming with a diverse team, whether you're talking about race or gender or function, like try to be an HR person collaborating with an engineering team someday. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a very different thing. It is. You know, yeah. Linda, it's funny because one of the things that I thought about and you were talking, you're so right about being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Yes, absolutely. And knowing that there are times you will not understand this person's journey. Yeah. So yeah. I'll give you an example. So I've seen situations where a person said, I understand what you're going through as a black person because I was the only redhead in, in my class. Um, that's kind of like, 
that's kind of like me saying to my wife, I, yeah. I, I know the pain of childbirth because I broke my arm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you, 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 it's one thing to, you know, uh, be sympathetic, to be aware, mm-hmm. but also you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. You have to know and you have to be comfortable that you won't always have the right perspective and, 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 and knowledge of someone else's background but you can still be supported. Right. No, and I think it's okay point, uh, to, to not always be able to empathize because right. you're not. You're not. Yeah. Right. We're yeah. not. Yeah. We can't empathize with childbirth, but, right. but, but we can understand. We can listen. We could be supportive. We could be an ally. Right. And we are to our to our I hope so. <laughs> you better, you better be in that room. But, uh, but, but, yes. uh, but that's the thing, right? So guys, um, I'm gonna, we've had such, I wish we had more time. <laughs> this is so great. We, we're gonna have to do this again. Oh, uh, man. Um, Rodney, Clarence, uh, Bill, Jason, Linda, uh, John, thank you so much. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it off to, to my partner, Dave here, but I just wanna thank you from my bottom of my heart, guys. This has been so great. We gotta do this again. We have you guys now. We're going to try to build an ecosystem with Bit. You know that we talked about it. So we got you guys now. You're going to hear a lot more from me. So, uh, David, take it away, man. Close us out. Thank you, Gerald. Uh, As we emerge from this valley of integration and ascend the mountaintop of equality, it is events, discussions, conversations like these that help us to travel what the old folks used to say, this rough and rugged road. Um, I want to thank on behalf of the Black and Tech leadership team, all of our esteemed illustrious panelists. Thank you very much for your openness, your candor, your honesty, your directness. But we just want to thank you because again, it is these conversations, it is these events like this that help to inspire change that help to not only drive the conversation, but to also put action steps in place that will help to inspire that change. And let's continue the discussion.